I'm Dr. Lieberman. I'm a hand and upper extremity surgeon at Houston Methodist in Houston, Texas. And I'm going to talk about musculoskeletal pathology as an early warning sign of systemic amyloidosis. So in terms of amyloidosis, it is a systemic disease with extracellular deposition of misfolded protein fragments. And as those misfolded proteins deposit in tissues and organs, it can cause dysfunction from, from compressive and degenerative pathology. The two most common misfolded protein fragments are transthyretin and immunoglobulin light chain, which result in a systemic disease known as either ATTR from transthyretin or AL from immunoglobulin light chain. And the systemic manifestations, which I'm going to be talking about two out of the three, can manifest in the nervous system, GI tract, and musculoskeletal soft tissues. But the cardiac um, uh, manifestations will result in restrictive cardiomyopathy, which is predictive of the morbidity and mortality of the disease. And once it um, accumulates in the uh, cardiac tissue, that disease, that um, accumulation is irreversible. So in terms of uh, treatment, uh, because the disease is irreversible once it manifests, um, once it uh, accumulates within the heart tissue, um, early treatment is you know, obviously vital. Um, it slows the disease progression, decreases morbidity, and also increases patient lifespan. So early diagnosis is key. And this is where I feel like orthopedic surgeons um, can make a huge impact because we can make, um, we can allow an earlier diagnosis for the patients. So in terms of uh, orthopedic manifestations of systemic amyloidosis, there are six orthopedic manifestations that I'm going to be talking about today. Carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar stenosis, hip, knee, shoulder osteoarthritis, rotator cuff pathology, biceps rupture, and trigger digits. And the musculoskeletal pathology, all of these manifestations tend to precede the cardiac diagnosis. And so screening with histologic testing during the surgical procedure could enable earlier diagnosis with a potential for improved morbidity and mortality from the disease. So we're going to be going over each of those six orthopedic manifestations um, and the literature that supports us potentially taking a, uh, a specimen in surgery. So in terms of carpal tunnel syndrome, which is my bread and butter, what we're talking about is numbness and tingling in the thumb through potentially half or all of the ring finger, but not the small finger. And we're also talking about weakness of the thumb muscle. And you can see the picture on the bottom left um, shows atrophy of the APB muscle, which is the muscle that uh, allows the patient to move their thumb in space. And the differences between amyloid polyneuropathy and diabetic polyneuropathy, amyloid is progressive numbness and tingling that's associated with also rapidly progressive weakness, whereas diabetic polyneuropathy tends to be very slow and it's not associated with weakness until the later stages. There was a study by Melandry done in 2015 that was looking at the prevalence risk factors and a correlation of cardiac amyloidosis with carpal tunnel syndrome. It was a retrospective study where they had patients with both ATTR as well as AL, and the prevalence of carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms was 35% in the ATTR patients and 8% in the AL patients, and their carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms preceded their cardiac diagnosis by nine years. Um, so as a result of that, Sperry uh, did a prospective multidisciplinary study looking at the prevalence and type of amyloid deposits in patients that were having surgery on their carpal tunnel. The inclusion criteria for this study were men over the age of 50, women over the age of 60, and patients undergoing carpal tunnel release. And in their study, 10% of patients were amyloid positive, 7 ATTR, 2 AL, and 2 at the time of their uh, carpal tunnel release surgery were found to have already cardiac involvement. Um, so due to those other two studies, Donnelly proposed an algorithm for, um, for biopsying patients with carpal tunnel, which was published in Journal of Hand Surgery in 2019, and it was based on a review of the literature. Um, he proposed a two-tier system for, um, uh, for biopsying carpal tunnel patients. Um, you either had to have two characteristics from tier one, which was age, male over 50, female over 60, and having bilateral carpal tunnel symptoms or a prior surgical release, 
or one from tier one and one from tier two. And these are other systemic um, manifestations of, of amyloidosis. So spinal stenosis, biceps rupture, AFib, a flutter, pacemaker, a congestive heart failure, or a family history of ATTR amyloidosis. And at this point, we are using this at Houston Methodist, um, this algorithm to biopsy carpal tunnel patients and have had a large percentage of B positive over the past um, three years since 2020. I do believe that the, the biopsying we're using this um, criteria should be standard of care. At this point, if you talk to most hand surgeons, it is not, but people are becoming more aware of it. So I'm hopeful that it becomes standard of care. This is a video of intra-op, me doing a carpal tunnel release. We'll see if this starts perfect. So I've already released the carpal tunnel. That's B pulling on the transverse carpal ligament. I'm then pushing the nerve out of the way. I'm then getting the tenosynovium, which is um, surrounding the soft tissue that surrounds the tendons. And in terms of a biopsy, you can either take what I'm demonstrating here, which is the tenosynovium, and I'm going to end up in this video taking a couple of specimens from different locations, which you want to do whenever you're biopsying amyloidosis. So you can either take tenosynovium or you can take a piece of the transverse carpal ligament. And I tend to take both intraoperatively to send it. So, and you can also see that it takes less than a minute and really doesn't add anything to the actual carpal tunnel release. So next we'll move on to lumbar stenosis. So amyloid-induced lumbar stenosis is also an early manifestation of systemic amyloidosis. And we're talking about the deposition of amyloid in the ligamentum flavum. Um, and so what the ligamentum flavum, it is soft tissue that um, connects one vertebrae to the other, which is demonstrated in the picture here. It's associated with a thicker ligamentum flavum than other um, uh, things that cause lumbar stenosis. Um, so there was a study that looked at the clinical, pathologic, and radiographic findings of um, lumbar uh, stenosis associated with systemic amyloidosis. And what they did was sample 95 ligamentum flavums in, a pa in patients that had lumbar stenosis surgery, as well as 21 ligamentum flavums in patients that were having disc herniation surgery. And in that uh, study, 100% of the ligamentum flavums actually stained positive for amyloid, 45% uh, percent of those were TTTR positive. Um, and what they found was comparing the TTR negative samples to the TTR positive samples that they had a thicker ligamentum flavum. And so at Houston Methodist, what we're currently doing is an evidence-based algorithm similar for hand surgeons, but it's for spine surgeons to identify appropriate patients to send ligamentum flavum for histopathologic evaluation for amyloidosis hopefully coming up with a similar algorithm for lumbar stenosis surgery um, that's similar to the carpal tunnel surgery. And so this is the study that we're currently doing, detection of transthyretin amyloid protein and the ligamentum flavum of patients at risk of systemic amyloidosis. It is a prospective non-interventional study um, of patients undergoing surgery for lumbar stenosis and they meet the criteria for ligamentum flavum biopsy based on a proposed tiered algorithm that includes some of the algorithm that they used for the carpal tunnel, as well as includes a thickness of ligamentum flavum. And our result so far is that we've had 37 patients enrolled, 10 have been positive for TTR with a 27% positive rate. So moving on to hip, knee, and shoulder osteoarthritis, um, amyloid-induced hip and knee arthritis. Uh, the ATTR patients and AL patients have reported positive biopsies of amyloid at the time of their hip and knee replacement. And uh, what we're talking about here, the hip replacement is in the picture on the top right, knee replacement is in the picture on the bottom right. And the arthroplasty tended to occur about seven years prior to the diagnosis of cardiac amyloidosis. Cardiac amyloid patients are also, that specifically ATTR patients, are five times more likely to have undergone a total hip than the general population. Now, we don't know what, you know what the correlation is to the systemic disease, and there are current studies at HMH trying to answer this question. Um, so this study looked at 313 patients with cardiac amyloidosis. Um, both ATTR as well as AL patients, and it wanted to understand the relative risk of 
joint arthroplasty in the ATTR and AL patients compared to the general population. So they wanted to know if these patients were more likely to have a hip or a knee replacement compared to the general population. And so what they found was that the relative risk was 23% in ATTR, 9.2% in AL. So it was significantly more common in ATTR patients to have a hip or knee replacement compared to the general population. But there was no difference between the general population and AL patients for hip and knee replacements. Um, at HMH, we um, we uh, published a case report on an amyloid-induced shoulder arthritis patient, um, where at the time of their index procedure, their total shoulder replacement, his x-rays are at the bottom left and the um, post-op x-rays are at the bottom right. Um, he, his synovium was sent for pathology, which was positive for TTR. Um, he did have, and I, I'm not a cardiologist, but my understanding is that he had stage one um, heart failure at the time of his ATTR diagnosis. Um, his surgery was over two years ago. He was started on treatment. And my understanding is that his uh, cardiac amyloidosis, his heart failure has not progressed since the time of the diagnosis. In terms of tendon pathology, there's an overall paucity of literature on tendon pathology and its association with systemic amyloidosis. Um, there is one study looking at distal biceps ruptures. Um, Geller in JAMA in 2017 looked at a cross-sectional study of patients with known cardiac amyloidosis and its association with distal biceps ruptures and found that in the ATTR patients, there was a 33% <laughs> of uh, biceps ruptures. Um, there is an unclear relationship with the systemic disease, and from a surgical perspective, these patients tend not to have surgery on their biceps ruptures. So from an orthopedic perspective, it's not necessarily a diagnosis that can help me um, get a tissue sample for the cardiologist. Uh, rotator cuff pathology, there was a study demonstrating the presence of amyloid and rotator cuff biopsies, where there was 23% positive TTR um, biopsies. Again, unclear relationship with systemic disease. And then from a trigger digit perspective, the same person that proposed an algorithm for a carpal tunnel also did a tr trigger digit study using a similar criteria. He did a prospective cross-sectional cohort study with 100 patients, so similar to the 100 patients in the carpal tunnel study, with a 2% positive rate. So it was present, but very low yield. And at this point, based on that study, they're not recommending um, biopsying trigger digits. So in conclusion, um, there is amyloid deposition in common orthopedic conditions, carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar stenosis, hip, knee, shoulder arthritis rotator cuff tears, bicep ruptures, and trigger digits. And so when a person comes into my office and they have multiple of these diagnoses, um, what I initially uh, think of is something inflammatory. So things like rheumatoid, lupus, gout. Um, but at this point, um, given what I've seen from an amyloid perspective, amyloid is now also on my differential diagnosis. So I think orthopedic surgeons, primary care physicians, everybody, um, if they see these um, conditions and multiple of these conditions, they should start at least including amyloid as part of the differential and potentially doing a workup if it's appropriate. From an orthopedic biopsy perspective, at this point, I feel like carpal tunnel release surgery um, using the criteria that was published in Journal of Hand Surgery in 2019 should be standard of care. I think it allows an earlier diagnosis, a potential for diagnosing 10% plus of, those of that population, diagnosing it earlier, getting them to the cardiologist, and ultimately improving their morbidity and mortality. Um, I can't at this point recommend biopsy for lumbar stenosis decompression, but I do think that once our study comes out that I will be recommending that. And then from a um, the remaining orthopedic conditions, I, I feel like there's more evidence that's needed regarding biopsying patients in their index surgeries for hip, knee, shoulder arthritis, rotator cuff surgery, distal biceps surgery, as well as trigger digit releases. With that being said, I have biopsied some triggers and I've had a couple of positive, including one AL and several ATTR. So I do think that more evidence is needed. And at some point, I'm hoping we can figure that out.